Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, interview with the Masters with Dana, Dana, sorry, Dana uh, Guerrieri. Uh, but before we start, just have a couple announcements to make. Uh, registration is now open for our 2D uh, classes. So for those of you who have not signed up for classes yet, just go make, make sure you go to the website and check out the registration page. Uh, we have a couple classes actually already filling up, so I would just say, even though you have like a month to basically register, please go ahead and sign up for classes now uh, because they do fill up quickly. Uh, beyond that, also we have our 3D Academy, which is going to be opening up registration tomorrow. So for those of you interested in taking some courses with the uh, 3D Academy, just check it out tomorrow. I think registration opens up for it as well on Monday. Um, but beyond that, uh, today we have Dana, who basically is a professional freelance illustrator and designer. Um, she has an amazing style and just a wonderful personality, and I can't wait for you all to meet her. Um, but before I do that, I'm going to pass control over to her so we can see her screen and find out more about her, her background, how she got into the industry, and what she's working on right now. So without any further ado, Dana, I'm passing control over to you. Right, let me switch over to make sure it's on the Cintiq screen. Okay. And while Dana does that, everyone, uh, please feel free to enter in all your questions as we go along. Don't wait till the very end. Uh, just enter any questions you have, and I'll read them aloud to Dana so she can uh, ask to answer them for everyone in attendance. So when you came in here, you should have saw a, I think it's basically like a question field that you can enter in questions. Uh, into and from there I can go ahead and read the questions aloud to Dana um, but okay back to Dana all right so um, yeah I'm a full-time freelance illustrator um, I've been doing this full-time for a couple years now um, before that I was doing some freelance work uh, part-time as a student um, pretty much the whole time I was a student in fact starting in high school I've been a very impatient person so I've been very into, you know, having an online presence and, you know, putting myself out there and finding whatever I can, um, you know, since I was a, a kid or a teenager, basically. Um, and I think that's definitely helped me a lot. Um, having an online presence is so important these days. So that that has definitely given me a leg up, I think, having that that foot in the door in that sense. Um, a lot of my work has come from people just noticing my work online. Um, right now, um, I'm pretty much doing almost full-time freelancing as a contractor for Gaia Online. Um, my work involved with that is pretty varied. I get to do anything from pixel art to character illustrations, designing characters and stuff like that. It's a lot of fun. Um, and I'm also doing some various other freelance on the side with that. Um, recently I started doing some character concept art for WayForward Technologies in Valencia. Um, unfortunately I can't show anything from them yet, but <laughs> that's, that's something I'm working on that's fun. Um, and that's, that's, I guess, what's going on now. Awesome. Uh, and before I continue again, again, everyone, please feel free to enter any questions you have into the question module. That way we can ask Dana uh, your questions. Uh, I have a question for you myself, actually. So did you think it was a hard process for you to transition from school to working professionally as a freelance illustrator? Um, it was, I think, not as, not as difficult or as complicated as maybe it seemed at the time. Um, like I said, I I have been really used to having an online presence. I've you know I've been in the habit of posting my work online and self promoting and all that since I was like 12 years old. You know, like you're supposed to be like 13 to have a DeviantArt account. Well, I was I was so rebellious. I signed up when I was 12. So I've really been <laughs> been you know posting my work online since since like that far. Um, so I've, I've always kind of been conscious of that and wanting to present myself, you know, in a, at least semi-professional way since, you know, a pretty precocious age. So there wasn't much of a transition in terms of 
having to think about presenting myself differently. Um, because I, I always, you know, I always had a like professional looking portfolio site since I was a teenager. I I didn't have to, you know, I didn't get to a certain point where I was like, oh, I'm almost done with school. I have to make a portfolio site now. I already had that. Like I already had all of that set up. I had to just basically keep doing what I was doing and the transition was just doing what I was already doing and turning that into full time. Right. And was there like any initial inspiration to think that way? Because that's very forward thinking for someone at 12 to already be anticipating <laughs> having this, you know, online persona or brand even if you want to call it that um, at such a young age. So who or what motivated you to even think and do that at that, that young age? And I think meeting fellow artists online um, and, you know, having that as inspiration having other people as, as role models in that sense helped a lot. Um, I had a friend who was just a couple years older than me, and she was, um, I guess, 14 or 15 at the time, and she was already doing, like, s semi full-time professional freelance as, like, a high school student, and I was like, I need to be like her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, too. So you, you, you start seeing other people around you in these online communities, and it, that, that can kind of give you the motivation you need. That can be the, the kick in the butt you need to start doing that kind of stuff yourself. Right. And do you consider this to be your dream job, your passion, in essence? Absolutely. Um, I feel very lucky that I'm able to do this, um, do what I love full time, and just you know sit at home and draw. That's, that's living the dream, <laughs> um, especially since I know a lot of a lot of friends of mine from school um, who are incredibly talented and, and deserve to also be working full time, they might still be struggling with, you know, having to have a day job, stuff like that. Um, I, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to pretty much just jump into this. Okay, that's awesome. Now, what are we looking at on your Adobe Photoshop screen there? Uh, so this piece is actually a couple years old now, but I think it's a it's a pretty good example of one of the ways I work. I wanted to show um, f uh, with a few of these pieces how I don't really have one single working method. I um, I sort of try to do something a little new or a little different with each piece. Um, you know, in terms of do I want this to be very flat and stylized looking, or do I want something that's much more um, painterly and atmospheric, stuff like that? Um, with this piece, um, my goal here was to basically achieve the look of like a still from a very high quality 2D animation with a painted background and then um, more like almost flat cell shaded characters on top that somehow still look like they fit into that painted background because I, I really love that look. Um, so what I did here was I actually painted the entire background without the characters first. Um, I have most of my layers in texture. It was actually hard to find files where I didn't merge absolutely everything when I was done. <laughs> Because I, I pretty much merge layers as I go along. I'm constantly merging and then just painting on the merged layers. Right. Um, but this one, I still have some layers intact. Okay. Um, but there's there would have been a lot more layers here as I was working that got merged as I went along. So what I did here for that, that cell characters on a painted background look was I actually did the characters in a separate file. I took out a piece of the background and I super, super enlarged it, and I worked really, really huge um, so that when I put them back in the other piece, it would be like that very um, animation cleanup line look where it looks very, very clean from afar. So I drew the characters this huge in a separate file and then pasted them back in so that it would have that very clean 2D animation look that I really like. So that's, that's just how I did this one piece. Um, it was a fun method. Was there a particular story that was in mind when you did this, or just conceptually investigating something, basically? Um, this is sort of like exploration or concept art for like a personal project that I'd like to do someday okay. um, that I think I would do as a comic. 
because I actually I had a pretty varied educational experience and I switched my major in school multiple times. I, I transferred majors and I transferred schools. Um, so I've studied everything from um, animation to comics to um, motion graphics to oil painting and all this stuff. So I, I always have ideas for my own projects on the side no matter what I'm doing full time. Um, so this this I'm sort of conceptualizing as a comic project. So a lot of my personal work is development for that. Okay. And you just mentioned that you change your major quite often. I think if you don't mind, if you can give a little bit more about those majors and, and what basically motivated you to change. Because a lot of, I think a lot of students, when they're first starting out, are not certain either about which direction they want to go or what they, what they should basically focus on. And here you are basically already changing it multiple times and still finding something new and, and, and different to do. So what was the main thing that drove you to look and keep searching for something else? Well, when I first started school, um, I went to, I started going to school at SVA in New York. Uh, School of Visual Arts, and I first went into their illustration major. I had done pre-college programs with them in illustration and comics, um, so I ended up going into the illustration program. And it didn't take me long to realize, basically throughout that first year, that the focus of that illustration department was not really what I was focused on at all. Um, it, it's a very editorial illustration focused department, and a lot of the the faculty teaching there were actually fine artists. Like I had my my foundation drawing and painting classes were taught by fine artists who weren't actually interested in teaching um, like a traditional atelier style like oil painting. Like we didn't, I, I didn't learn like you know the kind of very foundational like figure painting method you think you would you would want to learn as an illustrator because it was much more fine arts focused. Right. Um, it was basically I could I could tell this this was not going the direction that I was interested in going with my art, um, so I switched I changed my major from illustration to traditional animation um, because I figured I would want to go more in the direction of visual development stuff like that. So then I spent my second year there um, learning traditional animation, motion graphics stuff like that. Um, which was a great experience, and I'm I'm really happy I did that, even though it was kind of a detour because you know I learned skills that could br could be brought back to other things. Right. Um, I I feel like just learning tr traditional animation uh, pushed my drawing skills a lot, like more than anything. Even though I don't do animation anymore, just having to do that, having to learn it, was such a good a kind of drawing exercise or drawing practice, things like that, because it, it makes you think about so much about motion and about um, thinking about your characters as dimensional, being able to turn them in space, things like that, right. and just drawing a lot. You get so much more line mileage as an animator. You just get so much more experience because you have to do 500 drawings a week instead of five, you know? Um, so that was, that was a great experience, but then I also... At the end of that year, I had another, well, this actually, this department isn't actually the direction I want to go in because I think, I think overall the school wasn't a good fit for me just because um, on the East Coast in general, um, it was all in general more, more fine arts, editorial, etc. focused. So even the animation department there, um, the faculty were more concerned with molding people into independent filmmakers instead of training people to have specializations, to work in a studio, stuff like that. So I was like, well, I don't want to be an independent filmmaker. I don't want to, you know, kind of be a jack of all trades. I, I knew what I wanted to focus on, more like character design, visual development, stuff like that. So after that, after studying traditional animation, I then transferred to Art Center in Pasadena and moved out to California. And that was definitely, I, I I was then like, okay, this is this is where I want to be. I'm finally going in the right direction now. Um, I was there for about a year, and then I was like, well, this is too expensive. And I had been hearing a lot about um, Concept Design Academy in Pasadena. So it was in the same city. I was already right there. So I, I just left Art Center. I was like, well, you know, it's going to take me like another four years to finish up a degree anyway because I have all, like my credits are spread all over from all this 
major switching and transferring. So I was like, well, I don't, I don't need a degree. So I just started taking <laughs> classes at Concept Design Academy instead. Um, I took a couple classes in, in background painting, background design, character uh, figure invention, stuff like that. And that was a great experience as well. And then after doing that uh, for a couple semesters, that's after that I was able to transition into working full time. Wow, so that's it. I love that because basically it wasn't a, a, a straight path to where your destination was, but you ended up where you wanted to be ultimately, basically. And you yeah. just kept pursuing what your vision was, your 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 dream, and that's that's amazing. Um, yeah, even though I took all those detours, I, I don't feel like any of them were really a waste of time because all, all of those things, you know, even taking classes that didn't feel relevant to me, I think gave me something that I was able to take back into what I really wanted to do. Right. Uh, okay, perfect. Do you have any other images? I see a couple of tabs there. What else is there you, you have? So I have the, the characters I did separately, and then this is a piece I did for a Game of Thrones art book that's on Kickstarter right now. And I opened up this one because this is one of the few other pieces where I have, um, I still have a lot of the layers in text <laughs> instead of everything completely flattened. Mm -hmm. um, I think because there's multiple characters in this, if you count the dragons and the horse, <laughs> I wanted to keep all those different characters on different layers, so right. they're still all separated out, and I didn't merge everything. So I still have some stuff here where you can see the different layer modes I used for the lighting. I actually completely changed the kind of color scheme and lighting I wanted to use in this piece halfway through. Um, it was originally going to be daytime and totally warm, and I was able to just totally change that direction like halfway through the piece because I, I wasn't feeling where it was going. Right. Um, so you can kind of see with this setup here how the how that lighting was done. And then I have a totally different style, less painterly character I did here recently. And I was thinking with this piece since it basically has the flat color set up. I might be able to demo like painting over it a little. Like right. if I were to render this up, how I would do that. Oh, perfect. And actually I have a question that came from the audience that uh, basically asks, what is the price range you charge for your freelance work? Um, I usually estimate rates on um, the hourly work it would take. Um, that can either be an estimate based up front or you know keep track of how long something takes me though I usually I usually estimate a flat rate for my work because I am terrible at keeping track of how long something takes me I totally lose track of time so it's it's better for me to just say okay well this is this is generally going to take me say two days of work so that's you know maybe this many hours of work and then I, I base a price on that um, and of course, estimating that way, you have to you have to think what basically what you want to be paid hourly, um, and that you know it depends on the project, how it's going to be used, um, the kind of the kind of rights you're selling, basically stuff like that. Um, so there there's a lot of factors, and it varies. Right. And do you think? Well, I should say rephrase the question. Uh, was it a difficult process for you to figure out as far as how and what to charge people for your time and your work? Um, I don't think it's it's I don't think it's that difficult to figure out really. I guess the difficulty is in kind of I guess feeling confident in your prices. Um, I know a, a lot of artists starting out are students who are doing starting to do like freelance commission work and stuff like that. They severely undercharge themselves and there, there will be people, you know, who will come in trolling to your, I don't know, like Tumblr message box or something like that and be like, why are you charging so much? I can't afford that. You should charge $5 so I can buy one. Like, you know, you don't walk into a car dealership and say, well, I can't afford this sports car, so you should lower the price so I can afford it. So no, no one would do that. So you can't do that to artists either. So if, you know, if you hear any anything like that, just completely ignore it, I think. All artists should be way more confident in their pricing. 
um, really figuring it out is not the hard part. You can just Google around, you know, what's what's an average rate for freelance work, and you can get a bunch of other people's numbers and sort of average it out, you know, base it on your experience and all sorts of things. That's I think that's the easy part, and the hard part is really feeling secure in that and and learning to to trust your own judgment and trust that you feel what um, like you know what your art is worth and really standing behind that. Okay, great advice. Thank you for that. Uh, so this is a, a character you have, and I'm assuming it's for some story or work in development right now. Uh, do you typically sketch out your work as far as like black and white and then fill in with solid colors, or do you typically paint freestyle and whatever happens as far as the forms and shapes that come from the painting is what you get? Uh, I usually sketch out first. Sometimes if I'm feeling stuck on a pose or proportions or something, I'll do like a lasso tool silhouette. So I might um, sort of fill out a character pose or something, like just do it super rough. And then, you know, you can enlarge that after you fill it in. It's going to look really silly, but because <laughs> sometimes I feel like um, you can either sketch out really rough on one layer and then do clean line art on top if that's how you're working, but then the the line art on top of the sketch usually ends up being a lot stiffer than the sketch. Um, so this is a way I think to do line art that's cleaner than a rough sketch, but less stiff than doing the refined liner on top of the sketch, you know, so I'll, you know, then draw the character on top like this. And it would actually make sense if the silhouette made sense, but you get the idea. <laughs> <laughs> but um, for this one, I actually just, just straight sketched out. Um, and I think this was all on one layer, like there's no underdrawing and then inking on top, it was just sort of sketching and then cleaning up the sketch as I went along until it got to a stage where it was still kind of loose and had life to it, but not super messy, and then filled in the colors afterwards. Okay. I have another question from the audience here asking, was there something that was particularly hard for you during your freelance career so far? Um, I think for me, the main struggle is having to hold yourself to a schedule, having to organize yourself. You know, you have to keep track of everything yourself um, because you're your own boss. And if you're a very, you know, absent-minded person or very forgetful like I am, I, I have ADHD, like, literally. I'm not, I'm not saying that in an exaggeration way. Like, people will joke about, like, like oh, I'm so ADD. Like, I literally have it. So that has that can make things very very difficult with you know staying organized, staying on track, keeping yourself on your deadlines and stuff like that. And um, that's that's the biggest thing I think I was nervous about with going into working full time freelance. But I've I've been able to really you know discipline myself much better than I ever expected I would be able to. So. I think I think that's pretty encouraging because if, if I can do that, then anyone can. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome, actually. Yes. Uh, oh, another question came in. Do you? I'm actually raise a question here. So, do you always do your line art in Photoshop, or do you sketch it sometimes on pen and paper and then scan it in? Um, before I got a Cintiq, I did a lot of doing line art on paper with pencil stuff like that or sketching on paper and then, and then tracing it over with my art in Photoshop. But honestly, ever since getting a Cintiq, I just draw straight onto the Cintiq all the time. Um, when I do rough sketches on paper, it's usually extremely, extremely rough just to um, like iterate ideas um, really fast. And then I do the drawing straight into Photoshop. I don't really scan line art much anymore. OK, perfect. I'll let you get back to your, your demo here. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, so I guess um, I'll start working on this. 
So I had a, I had like a texture layer on top that adds a sort of watercolor paper texture and it also has that nice warm tone to it. And I had that clipped over the entire group because um, I have all this all the different parts separated out here. But I'm probably going to merge this all because that's, that's what I do. <laughs> so just merged all the colors underneath the lines. And then, so if I'm going to paint over this, I want to sort of tone down the line art and have it not be so solid black. Um, so I will actually lower the opacity a bit. What's your main reason for doing that? Uh, just so it's not so overwhelming and overpowering, so I can still sort of see the details that aren't defined by the flat colors. Um, because it, it just sort of becomes blobs with just the flat color, but it becomes much easier to paint over when it's not all these solid areas of black, especially because I inked this in a way where I sort of have, like, the shadow areas might be, like, a solid piece of black sort of totally inked in. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to use too much black if I am rendering this out in a painterly way. So I'm going to go with a dark purple. Too purple. Okay. So then I'll just bring in some more color. So the shadows aren't don't have too much pure black in them. Right. Now, do you have like an off-screen color palette that you source when doing uh, illustrations like this? Um, nope. I sometimes, you know, I all collect photos for inspiration and stuff, and I might have um, like a few things open, sort of like a mood board, but I rarely use like one specific image or like one specific palette or something usually have just a general idea that I want to go with. Okay. And I'm actually going to I put um, sort of a blue wash over most of the lines, but I'm going to make it a warmer dark red over the skin. How much time do you spend looking for reference or mood board materials before you dive into a project? Um, I I am constantly collecting reference, so I already have folders and folders of you know hundreds, if not thousands, of files <laughs> built up. So by the time by the time I'm working on something, I already I already have this whole library that I can choose stuff from pretty quickly. So Rarely, unless it's something very specific that I need really, really specific reference for, like if I'm painting something with like a ship, and it's like, well, I don't have any pictures of ships saved, so I'm going to have to Google that. But usually if it's just like, well, I'm designing a character that looks like they're in a, you know, like fantasy setting, I need some references of fantasy clothes, I have tons of those already. So I just open up my reference folder and pick out some stuff, and it's right there already. And, and I'm going to ask you a personal artist question. How organized is this reference folder? It's actually surprisingly organized. I used to be very disorganized <laughs> with my reference, but, you know, you sort of have, like, I think a lot of disorganized people, you sort of reach a breaking point where it's like, well, this one time a year I'm going to do my spring cleaning, and then everything gets organized about that one day. So I, I set up a system, like a, a system of naming files. This is how I'm going to organize them. This is the folders they're going to go in. And I've been able to stick to that pretty well. So that, that's been very helpful, I think. And I don't have to, you know, hunt through, you know, oh, my God, what folder did I save that in? What's the file name? It's like just a bunch of scrambled numbers or whatever. Right. That's perfect. So I'm just going to merge the lines down onto... The color, so I'm going to put this in multiply. Yeah. So it just merged 
totally everything. And I'm going to start setting up some very rough lighting. So I'm going to go with pretty basic um, cool shadows, warm light. So I put some blue multiply. I usually mess around with different um, layer modes to test out the lighting before I really settle on something because I think different different modes work better for different pieces. I'm actually gonna do this just to get an idea. This might work. One of the things I love in the last few versions of Photoshop, they added all these different options to the color picker, where you can just select just the current layer, current and below, all layers, all layers, no adjustments, because I'm always using adjustment layers and layer modes and stuff. <laughs> and I hated having to, I used to have to, you know, like, well, okay, now I have to change the layer mode to normal, then color pick, then go back. Yeah, that's actually a really handy feature there. And I'm going to start locking in the light. Actually, I tend to get cool. super perfectionist early on. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of a struggle to, to remind myself to keep it rough in the beginning, you know, go general to specific. Mm -hmm. Always a good thing to remember. I have to always tell myself that. In fact, I should just make this brush bigger. So I can always refine later. But the results already look really, really good. Thank you. I think everyone here is just watching, but remember you all can enter questions in as she's painting here. I think color and lighting is like my favorite part of working on anything. Like I, I don't feel like something is done if it doesn't have color on it. Even <laughs> like a rough sketch, I'm like, well, I, I should, I should put some color on this. It's not really. It's missing something. So I can't do like, oh, I'm just going to do a rough sketch for like 10 minutes. No, I end up like doing all the color and lighting and everything. <laughs> now, do you typically always color in your light sources and shadows? Or is there a case where you would leave it a simple, you know, neutral black and white type of? values? Um, it, it depends. Sometimes, um, again, with rough sketches, I might be able to restrain myself to just doing like flat colors or like grayscale tones and stuff, but um, that's usually for like studies, like animal studies, stuff like that, but usually with characters, I feel like it's not really finished until there's, I guess, some kind of atmosphere to the piece, even if it's just a character, you know, standing here doing nothing. Like, well, I should put some dramatic lighting on there just because I can. <laughs> and another question we have in from the audience is, how many hours do you usually spend on your work? It varies a lot, definitely. And again, I think I mentioned I am terrible at keeping track of how much I spent, how much time I spend on stuff. Um, I think it can vary anywhere from. I, I measure, you know, how long I work on pieces in, in sittings, like, how, how long can I work on this before I have to, like, get up and eat? Because <laughs> I just get, like, you know, when, when you get in the zone, you're in zone and you cannot stop, like, so I, I will get totally focused on something and maybe just sit there for, like, six hours until it's done, 
and sometimes a piece might be more involved, more painterly, maybe if it's like more of a full illustration with a whole environment and everything, it'll take more like, you know, 20 hours, who knows. Wow. I'm getting specific again. I need to make the brush bigger. <laughs> that's, that's always a good a good habit to get into. If you if you find yourself getting lost in the details too early, make the brush bigger. For a while, I was focusing on um, doing a lot more flat, stylized stuff, sort of that like paper cutout look. But I think recently, since a lot of a lot of the work I've been doing for you know for my job has been, um, I do a lot of pixel art stuff like that, and I don't get to, I don't always get to like do painterly stuff. So I think. I'm now like more interested in get again in doing painterly stuff on my own time. Right. Is pixel art more challenging as far as you know creating a particular illustration, or do you think it's the same principles and everything that you're doing right now? Yeah, surprisingly, a lot of a lot of the same techniques apply. Um, and for for the work I do, it's not always pure pixel art. It's usually um, at least the silhouettes are are pixel by hand, and then the the interior rendering can be a little more painterly. Um, so it's it's really interesting. I think the the actual you know the drawing and silhouetting in pixels is the most challenging part, but in a in a pretty fun way. I get I get super into it again, like I get into the zone with that and I get totally lost in just staring at pixels for hours. Um and it's it's simply one of those things where even though this isn't like I I have done a little bit of pixel art for personal work, like in my free time, but it's not like this is the one thing I want to do, you know? But it's one of those things that is definitely fun to do, definitely interesting, a learning experience and I think makes you think about things or think in a way that kind of um, opens your mind a bit or, you know, makes you think about things that you can bring back to non-pixel work. Right. I have another question that just came in. Uh, what's your favorite project uh, you've worked on so far or that you felt um, spoke to you in some way personally as an artist? Um, I might have to cheat and say <laughs> personal work. Because <laughs> um, I, I feel like if, if you have um, like a personal project you feel that you feel passionate about, that's, that's almost like a second job, you know, for yourself. Um, and I, I try to take it just as seriously, um, especially because a lot, of, a lot of other artists talk about how the thing they ended up getting noticed most from was, you know, a personal passion project that they were, you know, staying up late to work on, stuff like that. So the the personal stuff I'm developing, it's it I definitely feel that way about it. It's like a second job. It's it's just as important to me as anything else. And actually a question came in specifically about that. Could you share a little bit more about your personal project? Or even what it's about? Um, well, uh, as I think I mentioned before, it's basically being developed to be a comic. Like, that's the, that's the medium I had in mind for it. Um, it would be a fantasy story. And I'm basically in a, like, a script writing, story writing development stage. Um, so... It's it's very much in a in a planning stage, still doing some writing, some concept art for it, stuff like that. But it's I I feel kind of bad because I can't share too much about it because you know it's it's one of those things where like well if I shared everything about it then There's no it would give everything that. away. Exactly. <laughs> nope, that's fair. 
another question came in. Uh, would you work in an animation studio or do you prefer to work as a freelancer? Um, I would definitely, I think, enjoy that experience. I would definitely want to do that at some point. Um, it's something it's something I want to do at, at some point in my life, definitely. Um, but I'm I'm enjoying freelancing while I can now. Like I don't know, being on a, being on like a weird schedule, like sleeping sleeping late, working late. It's it's something that sometimes you can only do when you're young, I think. So it's sort of like, well, I'm gonna do this now and have fun working weird hours in my pajamas for now when I'm in my twenties, and maybe maybe like in a few years I'll want to. I guess it sounds like I want to settle down, settle down with a nice <laughs> studio, you know, a cushy right. office job. Again, this is insights that people usually don't have until they've actually done that as far as work the grind of freelance and the studio life and can advise it. But you've already have this foreshadowing of sorts of what to expect, which is well, awesome. I'm, I'm, I'm lucky that I've, I've had friends who've, you know, worked both situations. Right. Um, some friends who, you know, went to studios first and then later quit to do freelance or personal projects, stuff like that. So it's it's helped sort of seeing what's ahead through other people's experiences. And e even in school, I usually made friends with upperclassmen. Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't do it consciously as, like, a strategy, but it kind of is a strategy. <laughs> Um, to always see what's ahead of you, and honestly, that's actually part of how I was able to figure out, like, oh, this department isn't for me, I'm going to change my major, I'm going to transfer schools or whatever, because um, a lot of friends of mine who were, say, in that illustration department and who, who realized that it wasn't really the direction they wanted to go in, they didn't realize until it was too late. You know, they were already, you know, doing their, their thesis projects, and they were like, oh my god, this is not the kind of portfolio I wanted to be building. Right. This, this department is totally, you know, for someone else, not for me. And because I was just a freshman at the time, but I saw them going through this crisis that I, I could kind of relate to. I was like, oh my god, that would be me too if I were, you know, a couple years ahead. So I was able to get out before I went that far. That's awesome. So I basically have the lighting block in. There's a few more areas here. Very cool. I was like, did you weird adjustments? Like, oh, what if the light was hot pink? <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm gonna keep this. Maybe tone it down just a little. And then, okay, I'm just going to merge everything. And I think I might want to add a little more um, subtle variations. So, for example, Like I have, I have the the lighting blocked in, um, like along the the form and stuff. But I kind of want to have like a general overall shift from light to dark. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna do that on a soft light layer because it's a bit more of a subtle layer mode. Then have some shadows airbrushed in, but not too strong or anything. I basically want to set up as much as I can now so that when I'm rendering everything out, it's it's all you know, it's all set up and I don't have to change as much when I get to or when I've when I've already rendered stuff out. Right. But you can you can always make adjustments later, but I think it helps to have a solid foundation. 
Now, we have a couple more questions that came in. Uh, the first is, do you always get jobs? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, what, I'm, I'm not sure what that means exactly. It's like, or... I guess their I guess, question I guess is, it's asking, like, um, do I, do are I, you consistently, like, or is there, like, yeah, yeah, like, or is there, like, a dry month now and then? Well, I'm, I'm lucky that, um, my work for Gaia Online is, it's pretty much constant. Um, um, as a contractor, I'm working on a team that is constantly putting out work. Um, it's, it's not really, like, a, a a one-time job and then and then you're freelance with that company's over kind of thing. Um, so I've I've been lucky that you know one of my freelance jobs is almost as as permanent as you can get with a contract like independent contract position. Um, but for what I hear a lot of other freelancers say is that you know it varies a lot. Like you have months where you're super, super busy, that you have too much work, and then you have a month where you have nothing. But that's, that's just kind of how it works, where you have to, you know, save what you have in those busy times, and it'll hold you over when you have a, a dry spell. Okay. The next question is, what is your major source of inspiration in general? Movies, books, other artistic realms, something else entirely? Um, definitely, um, movies would be a big one. Movies, music, um, but I think movies are one of the biggest ones because I I like how film combines so many different media. Like it has, you know, it has visuals, it has sound, it has a written story, it has all those elements coming together. And you know, most artists are visual people. And I was I was a voracious reader as a child, but as I get older and I, I get busier, it's like I feel like I have less time to read. Mm -hmm. So I feel like movies are, are faster to consume and also for a for a visual person it's more intuitive. It's a, it, it can yeah, it can be a more immersive experience and it usually takes less time to experience the story when it's like a two-hour movie versus, you know, reading a book, uh, like a longer novel can take a lot longer than two hours, even if you're a fast reader, you know? Right. Like, I, I've actually read the entire um, Song of Ice and Fire series, the Game of Thrones books, and those, those are, those are quite a, quite a journey <laughs> to slog through. They are very dense books. Like, I, I was always, like, a fast reader in school. Those books are just dense. Wow. I have not had the privilege yet to read those, <laughs> if you want to call it that. It's, it's, a, it's a dedication. <laughs> the next question here is, um, actually, let me phrase it a little differently. Are there any moments or times when you can't draw anything, like you have a, a drawing block similar to like a writer's block. Uh, they they phrase it here as a sort of like a, a creative crisis, and if so, how do you overcome that or deal with it? Um, I think that the thing to remember when you're having one of those is that it's not that you literally can't draw. Nothing is stopping you. Like your hands are still there, unless unless someone chopped your hands off. Like you can still draw. And I'm sure you've all seen, like, <laughs> I don't know, those, those inspirational Facebook posts about, like, this guy only has feet, he has no arms, and he still, like, paints. But whatever, you know, like, nothing is physically stopping you. You can still draw even if you feel blocked. Even if everything is coming out terrible, well, you can still draw. So just draw a bunch of terrible stuff, and eventually it stops being terrible. Like, I think that's... um. Just do that's it. I, yeah, that's, that's usually what I use sketchbooks for now. Like I said, I usually draw straight onto the Cintiq for everything, and now my, my sketchbook is sort of a place where it's it's more of like... Um, Exploration, just thinking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's much more like if I just need to make a mess, you know? That's what my sketchbook is there for. Like if I feel like I just need to scribble a bunch of stuff down and I don't need it to look good, you know? I'll just fill a page with really, really terrible looking sketches. But I think I think that's still useful. That's I think that's still better than doing nothing. 
And there's also something to be said for taking some time to recharge and soak in some inspiration, you know, like sit back and watch some documentaries or something, like don't force it too much and maybe then go back and you're refreshed. Um, like with a, with a freelance schedule where you're really making your own schedule, it can, it can be tempting to maybe make your work your entire life and sort of not have a defined schedule where your work day ends and you have time to do your own thing or relax. And it's, it's a challenge to, you know, make sure you're being responsible about work, but also schedule in time to be responsible to yourself, to, you know, be a human being. Like, I, I try to, you know, have a point every night where I'm like, okay, my work day is over. I'm not going to, like, keep on working for 16 hours. Like, now I'm going to sit down and have a nice dinner, and I'm going to watch a movie or something. And it, I think if you don't do that, it's like, you're just becoming a drawing machine. Right, and you can't recharge your your creativity in a way because you're basically mm -hmm. draining it consistently. Awesome, that's great advice. Uh, the next question is a bit more forward and direct. Uh, how do you set up your freelance contracts or your business contracts? Um, it depends. I think it's a case by case thing because some some people. Um, Usually, if you're working for a company, they'll already have a contract and they'll send it to you. Um, but sometimes, if you're doing something more for like an individual, like a commission type of thing, you might have to set up your own agreement. But so far, I've usually worked with people or companies who have their own agreements already written up, um, and it's it's pretty straightforward. So the next question is actually, I thought it was pretty funny. Um, how much should you be sharing of that mess online, though? Because most artists share their best work, and for beginners or intermediate artists, that sometimes is quite intimidating. Yeah, that's, that's something I think you definitely have to keep in mind. It's something you have to remind yourself when you feel intimidated by other artists. Like, you're, they're curating their own work. You're only seeing the best. You're not seeing their horrible attempts that they are too ashamed to show anyone. <laughs> and I guarantee you that they are there. Hiding in the dark. Yeah. Like, if, if you don't want to share something, don't share it. Um, it's, it's up to you. Some people, I think, are more open about sharing stuff that looks messy or isn't, you know, super prevent. Uh, presentable or portfolio worthy. Um, it it all depends. Actually, I, I remember, and and not to interrupt too much, when I was in art school and uh, and particularly in high school, our art instructors uh, when they gave us our sketchbooks to start drawing in them. Um, whenever you did a fully rendered or beautiful illustration, you usually got marked down on it, or they ignored it completely because they're like the sketchbook isn't the place for that, you know, because everyone had to impress their friends and make their best drawing in a sketchbook. But it was more of like a scratch pad, an idea pad, a place for you to explore freely without, you know, worrying about if your lines are perfect or anything like that, unless you're like practicing a technique or something that's different. But they always made a, a big point about, you know, never getting stuck and trying to make a masterpiece in every single illustration. You know. Yeah, I, I, I actually totally agree with that. I always kind of roll my eyes when I see people like post sketchbook pages on their blog or whatever, and it's like this beautiful, like super clean, like they designed the whole page, <laughs> and there's like beautiful like typography, hand lettering, and it's like, I'm like, okay, like chill a little, like that's that's not really what a sketchbook is for. You're just doing finished pieces that happen to be found in a book. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, how do you? Oh, actually, there's another question here. How did you develop your Photoshop rendering knowledge? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the second part of that. How did I develop Photoshop? Yeah. How did you develop your Photoshop rendering knowledge? Oh, rendering knowledge. Um, honestly, just years of practice. I know that's the answer that no one wants to hear. They want to hear that there's like a magic secret or like a tutorial out there that will teach you everything. <laughs> but it's really just like, 
like I was saying, like I've been posting my art online since I was like twelve, and that tells you that I've been I've been doing art like digitally since I was like younger than twelve, even you know, like I've I've kind of always been doing digital art. Like I was trying to make masterpieces in MS Paint as a kid, and like as soon as I got Photoshop, I was just teaching myself. So it's it's really just years and years and years of trial and error and practice. Okay, and actually another question that came in, I think you kind of answered, um, which was how do I gain the best rendering knowledge? I guess it must mean in Photoshop, and you just in a way answered that. Yep, <laughs> Tri trial and error, constant practice, and as always, um, Again, it's the kind of answer no one wants to hear, practicing from life and that kind of stuff. The right. stuff that isn't fun. <laughs> Eat your vegetables. <laughs> exactly. Uh, do you limit the number of revisions um, that you allow yourself to do when you're in a contract with someone? Um, it depends. If it's, if it's something where I set up a flat rate, then I'll have, you know, after the first revision, you know, you get revision fees after that. But if it's something where it's I'm charging an hourly rate or a day rate, I don't have to really worry about that because it's like, okay, well, I'm going to spend more time doing revisions. I'm going to rack up more hours on this invoice. So. Okay. So everyone, we're approaching our one hour mark pretty soon. So any last minute questions you have, now's the time to enter them. Um, and again, uh, actually one second here. Okay, they're entering questions in now. <laughs> so, so the next one is, um, this is a, actually a, a really good question. Do you think or can you still make it if uh, you don't go to, to art college? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I described my whole weird, constantly shifting school experience, and that ultimately ended with not getting a degree. Um, and I know, I know plenty of people who have started working without ever having gone to school at all. Like, I, you know, had a partial education. Some people are able to jump into it with with no education or with um, no formal training. I guess I guess no, no one no one really has no education because even if you don't go to school, you're still you're still self educating as long as you're using whatever resources you have. Right. That's that's still an education, really. Very true. Okay. If there are no more questions, I thought a few more were coming in, but if there are no other questions, basically, I think we have reached our one hour mark. So I'd like to thank Dana for being an amazing uh, inspiration for us all today and for showing us some of her techniques and, and, and artwork. Um, and to the audience, I'd like to thank you on behalf of CGMA for participating in today's interview with the master. Uh, don't forget that registration is open now for our 2D classes for the spring term, so please go ahead and check out those classes and sign up for them. But more importantly, if you want to sign up for Daniel's class, hers is available this term as well. So please check it out and sign up for classes now. Um, and then remember tomorrow, for those of you who are also interested in 3D uh, classes, those will be opening up tomorrow as well. Um, beyond that, I have to thank all of you for participating in today's session. To Dana, again, you're amazing. You're awesome. Thank you so much for your time on this Sunday, this Easter Sunday for those of us who celebrate it. Um, and yes, thank you so much. Thank you for having me.
Take care and bye-bye everyone.